But the, uh, the other thing, the main thing I want to talk about is uh, consciousness. And I don't think we have a hope in hell if the human race doesn't get some more consciousness. I really don't. But I feel like there are many signs of growing consciousness. And lest we get too pessimistic, I've got a little list of ways in which our consciousness as a human species has grown in the last 500 years. 500 years ago, the majority of nations we might call civilized believed in the divine right of kings to rule. 200 years ago, slavery was legal in this country. 100 years ago, women couldn't vote. When I was a kid growing up in Miami, I remember driving to the other side of town, which was a good long way from Miami Beach, and, uh, and seeing segregation in action. In fact, my parents were in the hotel business in Miami Beach when Miles Davis, Miles Davis came to play, or Sammy Davis <laughs> Jr. came to play at the Fountain Blue Hotel. Guess where they had to sleep? An hour away on the other side of town. Mm. So segregation in my lifetime, in my lifetime I saw it. Um, there was no ecological movement when I was born to speak of. There was no women's movement to speak of. Um, in the 1970s, we stopped a war, Vietnam War. That's never been done before, or since maybe. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but there was, before the Vietnam War, who, pro who you know, were protesters marching around uh, when Napoleon invaded the rest of Europe, you know, holding signs, you know, yeah. No war with Europe. You know, we, we, things have come a long way. Um, there's the famous Martin Luther King quote, the, uh, which I'm probably going to get wrong, but it's something like, uh, the arc of, of change is long, but it bends towards justice. Something like that. Which is quite a thing for an uh, African American man who grew up in his times to say. So, um, but as far as growing consciousness, we're practicing the best tools the human race has for growing consciousness. I, I don't know another tool other than meditation, mindfulness, zazen, another set of tools that have been developed precisely for that purpose. They're certainly the best ones we have for that purpose, and they've been 2,500 years in development. Now, I do believe, this can't be proven, but I believe that every person who realizes something adds to the collective realization of the human race. I believe intention matters. I believe that sending positive energy and love to the planet matters. I believe that doing meta for the, and compassion practice. All these things matter, you know. Um, I also think that, um, that remembering Bernie Glassman's um, work and his, his formula for approaching change consciously um, begins with not knowing. Well, I think we're all good at that. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know what to do really, do we? But, uh, but that kind of not knowing also means open-mindedness. It means we never, dis we, that goes for our lives, it goes for our sangha, it goes for the center we live in. We don't know what's coming next. Uh -huh. We have to sensibly hold the past in mind, but, but maintain beginner's mind and, um, and not have fixed ideas, not step into this situation with fixed ideas. And this has never happened before. The balance of the planet has never gone out of whack like this before. We, don't, we can't possibly know what to do. Nobody does. Um, bearing witness. Well, I think we're all doing that. That's what we spent this week doing, really, with all the talks. Um, but then, now, I don't want to rewrite Bernie, but he does change his third tenet um, of the Buddhist peacemaker order. Um, I don't know what it is currently. It's been loving action. It's been compassionate action. What, do you know what it is right now? Is it just it's action based on 
maintaining a mind of not knowing and bearing witness. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. So uh, I've liked all the versions of it, yeah. Um, to take action rooted in practice, and then maybe we know what to do. Um, for me, um, I'm putting all my eggs in the consciousness basket. Right? Um, I feel like the fact of the Dharma growing in the West and the mindfulness movement, uh, you know, in England, there was a, uh, the Houses of Parliament did mindfulness training. Um, I don't know, I don't know that they all did, but a, but a large s section of them, like a third of them, uh, across all the political spectrum, participated in mindfulness training. And uh, I heard Stephen Batchelor speak about that. And, uh, you know, he was a monk under the Dalai Lama in 1967. He was a hippie monk, he's, and he's English. He said, when I was a hippie monk under the Dalai Lama in 1967, I didn't even dream that in my lifetime that the Houses of Parliament would be investigating mindfulness like this. So, um, some of you have heard this quote uh, from Arnold Toynbee, um, the uh, well-known historian, that the 20th century's most important event, which is often overlooked by history, won't be any of the various technological innovations or even the defeat of Hitler, or et cetera, et cetera, it will be the coming of the Dharma to the Western world. And um, when I first heard that, it must have been 20 years ago, I thought, well, I sure hope so. But when balanced in practice, we turn towards the problems in the world. We, there's a price to pay for that, and the price of that is grief. And there's a reward, which is joy, and they go together. And we have to know that, that grief is a part of turning toward the suffering of the world. But also we need to inspire ourselves through practice, but also through engagement with nature and beauty. And. Uh, Beauty should be one of the major food groups, you know, <laughs> that, that feed the human soul, riboflavin, vitamin E, laughter, love, and beauty. There you go. Uh, um, if you combine beauty with laughter and love, you get a perfect protein. So, but I say grieve, but don't despair. And I think this is really important. A lot of us fear that if we turn towards the suffering, that will, that will fall into despair. But this is exactly what practice gives us the power not to do. Because falling into despair is a thing we do. It's not a thing that has to seize us. It can seem like it seizes us, but we can feel those feelings and not paint them into a despairing story which will make us go deeper and deeper. I, I have moments of depression for sure, and anxiety both with looking at the state of the world, but to despair would be, would be to give up. And isn't there a famous quote by a wise monk that goes something like, the only real failure is to give up trying? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I think we need to uh, remember that and there's great joy in trying. You know, the Peace March was one of the high points of my life, and even though things looked kind of dire at the point at that point with the arms race, you know, so we were facing something quite difficult. But the collective action and the love, and just the joy of that, and the feeling of being engaged in something that means something. I mean, at least if we give the world, and it's I'm talking about. All my eggs are in the consciousness basket. I'm talking about giving to the world through giving to the Dharma. And the more people practice the Dharma, and the more people are exposed to meditation and mindfulness, my hope is that that's the thing that will, that will bear the right kind of fruit, ultimately. Um, you know that engaging in that, at least when we come to the end of our lives, we don't have to think, eh, I should have done more, right? You know. Um, we're a really young species. We're a really, really young species. We have a ways to go. 
and I hope we get to have the chance to see what we become. Um, in closing, I want to just remember our vows. Um, and um, the current version of Creations Are Numberless, I vow to receive them. Now, the first version I learned and the version we still have in the verse of the Kesa and in our meal chant is still saving sentient beings. And that's the first version I learned to save all sentient beings. And I think just about every place I've practiced has revised that because it sounded born again, salvational, Christianal, you know. Um, but more and more I'm feeling like, no, no, maybe we better get back to saving, yeah. saving those suckers, you know. <laughs> I mean, really, maybe, maybe we need to get back to reconsider, you know, being, you know, a more active vow, because that's what's behind the vow. Is to is to deliver and save all beings. It's a heroic vow, mm -hmm. and we won't see the outcome in our lifetimes. But um, so, just in closing, um, there's a haiku by the haiku poet Isa. I think it was from the 18th century, and uh, I think it describes our what I've been talking about so well. Very simple, goes something like, uh, a cricket floating on a branch downstream, singing. Of course, the right number of syllables, what we call the right number of syllables, 17, doesn't translate from the Japanese, but floating on a branch downstream, mm -hmm. a cricket singing. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I just love that image because, hey, we may feel like we're going on the branch downstream, but let's not forget to sing, <laughs> right? Um, so wouldn't it be funny, because if you go back to the original story of the Buddha, the legend, it said that there was a prophecy when he was born that he would either be a great king or he'd be the salvation of the world. And the story goes that his father wanted to become wanted him to become a great king, and uh, and therefore sequestered him in the palace and didn't let him see anything bad. And I think we all know the story. Um, but back to revisiting the mindfulness movement, I you know it's everywhere on the cover of Time magazine and Newsweek and all, other countries and all over the world. I hear more and more about it. I've got a student in Germany who's deeply involved in mindfulness with Syrian refugees. It's all over Europe, it's spreading all over the world. Wouldn't it be funny if, uh, if in the end it was the salvation of the world, you know? Um, wouldn't it be funny if that prophecy did come true, that 2,500, 2,600 years later, that, that consciousness was the thing that turned us around? I figure the Dharma is as good a candidate as anything for world salvation. So thank you all. <laughs>